So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to the Darien Library's um, Strong Women in History talk on Kate Warren. Uh, we have our um, speaker, Mark Albertson, here today. I wanted to um, let you know that all our speakers are brought to you by uh, generous donations to the annual Darien Friends Campaign. And that without that, we wouldn't be able to have these really informative speakers brought to us. With that, I, with that, I say, take it away, Mark. Good afternoon. And uh, welcome to the Danbury Library and talk number four on strong women in history. Uh, we have one more to go next week. And that is, uh, I suppose maybe that's the way to end it, Amelia Earhart. I think one of the big attractions of that lady is that there's no closure. You know, wh what really happened to her? We don't really know. And next week, we'll get into some of the, as we end that talk, some of the most outlandish outlandish, uh, even ridiculous uh, notions as to what happened to her. But today uh, is a Kate Warner. Now, this talk is not going to be as long as the one for Amelia Earhart. Uh, there's really not much known about this lady, except she goes down in American history as the first woman, first female detective. And she worked for the Pinkerton Agency, Alan Pinkerton. Uh, that agency actually started in 1850 and is still around today, by the way. It is still around today, although its beginnings here in the 1850s are interesting. And we're going to get into a little bit of that, too, especially with the Civil War. Uh, but Kate Warner herself was born in, eight, in 1833 in Erin, New York, E-R-I-N, which is in Shemung, Shemung County, New York. Not real, again, not really much is known about this lady. Although they do know from what the research I found that she was already a widow by the time she was 23. However, getting into how she got into the, the, the Pinkerton Detective Agency, she's in Chicago, and there was an ad. Matter of fact, they must have, they must have ran uh, various ads. Uh, there was an ad in one of the Chicago papers. Uh, for the Pinkerton Detective Agency. So she goes into the Chicago office. Now, Alan Pinkerton is one of the people that, that actually meets her. And his impression was, first off, again, here we go with first impressions, right? How many times have your mother, has your mother and father told you that one? Don't go by first impressions. Uh, you know, well, what are you here for, a clerical job? No, I want to be a detective. Well, this is uh, this is this is unheard of. A woman as a detective, and she sits down with them and begins to talk to them about this about this possibility of a female detective, and she states that do you know that women can go places that men can't? Women can actually fathom out information that from 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 areas that areas on a body that perhaps men wouldn't even dare to tread. Uh, women using their female wiles, and I'm not just talking about sex here, uh, can find out information from a criminal's wife or girlfriend that perhaps men cannot. You know, she brings all this, all these sort of avenues that, women, that female detectives can go down to uh, in order to get a job. Guess what? They're gonna hire her, 1856. And interesting, the observation that Alan Pinkerton had about this lady. He said, and this is what he says, he, he put this in his book, uh, the, Sp uh, the Spy of the Rebellion. It's about the Pinkerton organization dur dur during the, the Civil War. He called it the Rebellion. It came out 1883. But he says of her, she was a commanding person with clear cut expressive features, a slender brown haired woman graceful in her movements and self-possessed. Her features, although not what could be called handsome or beautiful, let's say, were decidedly of an intellectual cast. Interesting. Her face was honest, which could cause one in distress instinctively, according to Pinkerton Co Company records, to be further described, uh, to be, to be, to be, to select her as a confidant. Interesting. And 
so she becomes this detective in 18, 1856. And she really doesn't make her mark until 1858 down in Montgomery, Alabama. And it's called the Adams Express Affair. There was, uh, there was embezzlement going on at the Adams Express Company. And the company couldn't reach, couldn't find out who was really looting all this money uh, from the company. And so they put, they put Kate Warner on the case. She picks out a man who she has, uh, who she thinks is the crook, but she can't prove it. Man by the name of Maroney. So what does she do? She does something that probably maybe most men wouldn't even think of doing or do. She makes, she becomes uh, good friends with, Miss, with Mrs. Maroney. And she cultivates this relationship for a period of time until finally she's able to pick up a few tidbits here until finally she finds out that it's Mrs. Maroney's husband who's involved in embezzling the company. Now, keep in mind, this is 1858 and Mr. Maroney embezzled $50,000. That's a lot of money back in 1858. And in the course of bringing him to justice, she also recovered $39,515 of the, of the missing $50,000. So it was a pretty good start or a pretty good first real big case that Kate Warner uh, solves. Uh, Alan Pinkerton is so impressed and now he understands uh, what Kate was telling him during the time of her interview. He makes her the, the supervisor of the female division. They are gonna start this in the Pinkerton guards, the P Pinkerton detective agency. Now, getting into 1861, uh, the war is going to start. And the United States does not have, they certainly don't have the FBI. They really don't have an intelligence service. Forget the Secret Service. The Secret Service really does not come into being until July 5, 1865. And there it's part of the Treasury Department. It's called the Secret Service Division. It doesn't even exist at this point. Although I don't know how many people ever saw the movie Springfield Rifle with Gary Cooper and the Union Army was trying to discern who was who was raiding uh, Union, Ar Union Army, uh, Union Army uh, 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 horse drives. You know, they were trying to get horses for the Union Cavalry. And David Bryan is in this, Lon Chaney Jr., uh, Paul Kelly, and Gary Cooper goes undercover as, as a Union Army major and he solves, he solves the, the issue in the end. And he supposedly at the end nominated, he's raised to Lieutenant Colonel and nominated at the end to be the head of a new Secret Service Department. That's during the war, the Secret Service Department or military intelligence. But th th this, all this doesn't really transpire till the end of the war. It was really the Pinkertons that were doing all the espionage and intelligence work really uh, for the Union Army during the war. And so, uh, however, a man by the name of Samuel H. Felton comes calling here in early in 1861. Felt, Mr. Felton is the president of the Philadelphia Wilmington Baltimore Railroad. Uh, he's got various concerns here. His concerns are he knows his railroad is gonna be carrying a lot of supplies and even troops and military equipment for the Union Army. He knows this already. And he's concerned, very much concerned with Confederate or Southern espionage. And he wants to bring in the Pinkertons. Come to find out that the Pinkertons, even in February of 1861, fathom out a plot by Southern secessionists to assassinate President-elect Abraham Lincoln. Keep in mind, presidents do not take the oath of office here uh, until March 4 uh, of, the, of the year. And the Lincoln's inaugural address will be March 4, 1861. And so 
Mr. Fel Mr. Felton getting together with Alan Pinkerton, uh, you know, they make they make plans here to sprinkle Pinkerton agents throughout and uh, getting into Maryland and even Pennsylvania, because the railroad is the Philadelphia, Wilmington, Baltimore Railroad. So they're going to have Pinkerton agents in Maryland because Maryland too. Let's, let's, let's not forget Maryland too was a hotbed of Southern sympathy. There were plantation owners in Maryland. That's where that's where Harriet Tubman came from, a plantation in Maryland. In fact, during the war, it wasn't unusual for Lincoln to travel by train at night through Maryland because of the because of the secessionist threat or 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 potential guerrilla threat threat spy or whatever the case may be and so here there they do get a plot and this is on february 3 1950 1861 because the pinkertons are already pinkertons are already investigating already investigating a hotbed of secessionist activity that they're beginning to put together pieces of a plot to assassinate Abraham Lincoln. Now, during this investigation, uh, the, during the, this this investigation, Kate Warner will be sent to will be sent to Maryland, and she various aliases, uh, bogus names, fake names like a, like a Mrs. like a Mrs. Cherry, a Mrs. M M Barley. And she's beginning to track or get on the trail of suspicious movements and activity among Baltimore secessionists. Now, I'm sure you can say that this is this is this is kind of this is this is a dangerous work. And interesting what she does at one point here. And she goes to Baltimore or in the Baltimore area. And there's a hotel here called the whole class, it was a classy place, the Barnum Hotel or the Barnum City Hotel. And she goes here uh, posing as a rich Southern belle, very flirtatious and a spendthrift. And she begins to cultivate certain acquaintances, making bogus friendships. And she's putting more and more together of pieces she picks up, seeing, hearing, whatever the case may, or hears from the people she's meeting on a plot against uh, plot against Abraham Lincoln. And so Alan Pinkerton's going to send more agents into Maryland. And supposedly they the Southern secessionists even know Lincoln's plan of travel here on his way to Washington, DC in February. And he's supposed to take the train from Springfield to the Capitol, train ride. He's going to take the train. And once you get to, once he got to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the train was supposed to go on its way to the south. It would go through Philadelphia. It would go through, it, it would go through Baltimore and then on to Washington, D.C. Uh, the thing with Baltimore is here. This is where this is where the plot was supposed to really thicken here. Once they get to Baltimore, uh, the the once they get to Baltimore, the northbound end of the station was at Calvert Street. The southbound end of the station was at Camden Street, now called Camden Yard Station. And in between, at the station. There's approximately a mile distance. And you, so you would take, if you're coming in from the north, you stop at Calvert Station, you're taken by a carriage, which you want to call it a, mod, a taxi back then, to, to the Camden Station. And then you take your train and continue on. The idea of the plotters was as Lincoln would take his carriage from Calvert Station to Camden, to Camden Street Station, there would be a fight, uh, a, a, a row, an argument that would start up. Because keep in mind, there aren't very many policemen here at the Camden Station or at the Calvert Street Station. There aren't very many policemen. You know, it's really the few policemen here and the Pinkertons. 
And so they would have a fight or a row or any kind of disturbance. And that's when they would kill Lincoln during the disturbance. The, I, the escape route was in one of the, uh, one of the inlets uh, near, near, near Baltimore. Uh, they would jump into a boat and make their way into Chesapeake Bay and finally get to Virginia. That was, that was really the gist of the plot. Lincoln, you know, they have a meeting here with on February 21st. There's a Norman Judd, there's an Alan Pinkerton, and uh, Lincoln. Lincoln doesn't put much, doesn't put much uh, uh, the, uh, faith in this in this plot. He doesn't think it really exists. But they get a but they get a little help here. Frederick Seward, who was the son of William H. Seward, who was Secretary of State designate. He also understands that there is a plot against Lincoln. Lincoln now takes it more seriously. Lincoln tells them he is not going to deviate his schedule. He's going to go to Harrisburg. From Harrisburg, the train will push on to Virginia, push on to Philadelphia. Here, he is supposed to give three speeches. He is supposed to raise the American flag at Independence Hall. And then after that, go to a dinner. He's not deviating the schedule. So in comes in Kate Warner. She's ordered on February 18. She's in New York City on February 18. This is three days before that meeting. She is ordered, she is ordered ahead of time by Alan Pinkerton to take the train and go to Baltimore. So that's what she does. She gets to Baltimore and Interesting, you know, Lincoln goes through the schedule, especially in Philadelphia. He gives the three speeches. He raises the flag in Independence Hall and goes to this and, and goes to this dinner. However, his press secretary, a man by the name of John George Nicolay, that's that's his actually his private secretary, per the plans laid out partially here by Kate Warnock. Uh, excuses Lincoln from the dinner early and changes his clothes. He's also going to have a shawl, and he's to act the he's, he's to act the case as an invalid. He will get on the train and travel as an invalid. Once they get to Baltimore, interesting. Once they get to Baltimore. Uh, or near Baltimore, Kate Warner will get on the train. And as she tramps through the train, tramps through the train, and she has, she has, she's supposed to be an older lady, she meets Lincoln, who she considers her brother. And they have this, they have this meeting, and you know, it's very, very, you know, very loving and so on and so forth. And Lincoln uh, gets to Baltimore dressed up as this invalid. He's, he's limping and he has the shawl on. And he's, so he's really camouflaged. He's really, he's really wearing, wearing this disguise. And the carriage will take him from Calvert Station to Camden Station, boards the train, and safely gets to Washington, D.C. That's how they avoided the murder of Lincoln in late February, 1861. And then what, a week later, March 4, what is he doing? Giving his inaugural address. Uh, Kate Warner, was, uh, uh, Alan Pinkerton stated that her help here was invaluable, absolutely invaluable. And so that will result in Lincoln making it safely to to uh, Washington DC and then take the oath of office, become president. But during the war, uh, the, Pinkerton, the Pinkerton company itself uh, was actually taken on here by George B. McClellan. Uh, McClellan was supposed to launch a huge invasion of the Virginia Peninsula, spring 1862. 
Lincoln wants the war over now. We're talking March, going into April, 1862. And they launched a huge invasion of, 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 the, of, the, of the Virginia Peninsula, upwards of 100,000 men. I mean, there were ships and barges coming down the Potomac with all sorts of war material, not just men, guns, powder, ball, horses and mules, all manner of supply, 100,000 men. This is kind of what you're going to see later on in the 20th century, like at Gallipoli. How about, how about Sicily? How about Normandy? How about Okinawa? So you're seeing amphibious warfare. But the Pinkertons were taken on as the intelligence service for McClellan as they're advancing across the Virginia Peninsula uh, in, in the, to, to get to Richmond and knock the Confederacy out of the war. Uh, they'll fail to do that, by the way, and the war is going to go on until 1865. It really didn't, it didn't get to that part at all. Uh, Kate, by the way, uh, did, did various, uh, did various underground work. She would actually, interesting, some of the names she, she used, uh, as aliases during the, during the American, during the American Civil War. Kate, K, K-A-Y, Warner, K, Warren, W-A-R-E-N, K, Warren, W-A-R-R-E-N, Kate Warner, she used a real name. Kate Warren again, only not K, it was Kate. Kate Warren instead of K Warren. Kitty Warner, using her real neural name, but calling herself Kitty. Kitty Warren, W-A-R-E-N. And then also uh, Kitty Warren, W-A-R-R-I-N. She was, um, she would pose uh, every once in a while as Alan Pinkerton's wife when maybe they were uh, on a mission, or his mistress. Now there are some that do say, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into that too uh, really here, but I have to bring it up that he was, she was his mistress. Now whether that's true or not, uh, I don't know, but that came up. However, after the war, she was in some high-profile cases for Pinkertons. Once was a so-called bank teller. This is in 1850, this is in 1858, 1856 rather, pardon, 1865, pardon me, I'm sorry, 1865, 1867. And there, there, there is this bank teller named George Gordon. And Gordon was murdered supposedly by a man by the name of Alexander P. Drysdale. Now nobody could get the goods on Drysdale, and there is that, and the, and he got away with a hundred and thirty thousand dollars, a hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and Kate Warner uh, uses her, her one of her real tried and true methods. They nobody could get the goods on Drysdale, so what did she do? She made friends with his wife. First an acquaintance, then you establish the closeness, then you attempt to pick up the little tidbits, the intelligence, the information they need, and sure enough, they become really close friends. She, she took the name Mrs. Potter. It paid off. They got the goods on them, and they arrested, they arrested Mr. Drysdale. And in, so she helped broke that case and he had the stolen money. So they got the stolen money back. Uh, she, by the way, um, she will get sick and she will die in 1868. You know, she's only about 35, 36 years old. And Pinkerton will later say about, and she was the supervisor of female detectives at Pinkerton's, he said to her, this is what he said about her. In my service, you will serve, this is what they said about the detectives here. In my service, you will serve your country better than in the field. I have had, I have several female operatives. If you agree to come on board, you will be training with the head of my female detectives, Kate Warner. She never let me down. 
he also had um, he had great regard for her. And interesting what he did here was she was buried in Chicago. And she was buried on Pink, in, a, in a Pinkerton graveyard, really. And Alan Pinkerton had it etched in an agreement that her grave is never to be moved or dug up. That's how much of a regard he had for her. Now, keep in mind how historically significant this lady is, who we don't really know all that much about. Women could not join in this country, could not join police departments until 1890. They could not become police, police women until 1910. Yet she's already helped foil a plot in 1861 against President Abraham Lincoln. And she did her job. Uh, with the utmost professionalism. However, interesting here, did, did, but did, did, do, did she help as well as the Pinkertons themselves? I mean, keep in mind after the war, you know, the war is over 1865, the War of the Rebellion, if you want to use that term, the, the Civil War, the War of Northern Aggression, however you want to look at it. Uh, you know, they will be hired, the Pinkertons will, to break up strikes, uh, to infiltrate banks to filter out maybe employees who are trying to sift, uh, trying to stiff a little money out from under the table. Uh, they will be hired to do a variety of different things. And interesting, this is going to help lead, in my opinion, to what's going to be popular in the 20th century, the private detective. The private te detective, the sleuth, the private dick, as it used to be called in the movies. Because when you get into the 1920s, the teens, 1920s, the dime store novels, the novels you used to see, the all men actually used to see on, 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 the, on the newspaper stands or next to the newspaper stands. And this is where you begin to see people like Dashiell Hammett come out. Hammett uh, at one point had been a Pinkerton. He will write a number of stories. Uh, the Thin Man, remember William Powell, the series of movies, uh, Continental Ops. He also writes a story that was made into a movie at least four times. First in 1931 under its name. In 1936, Satan Takes a Holiday, I think the name was, with... Um, uh, Betty Davis, who she said is the worst movie. The, 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 the movie was movie really was 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 a was a dog, and she said she'd never make a movie like that again. But it came out again in 1941, and it's one of the greatest detective movies ever made, anytime, anywhere. And the book is called The Maltese Falcon, with Humphrey Bogart. Bogart really solidifies that personality of the hard-boiled, wise-cracking private detective. And so this notion of private detectives, you know, coming out of coming out of the, 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 the 19th century with the Pinkerton. Pinkertons are private detectives. That's not a city police force, it's not a state police force. It filled in the gap during the war, the Civil War, that is. Why? Because you didn't have a counterintelligence service. You didn't have a secret service. So you had people like Alan Pinkerton, Kate Werner. And keep in mind here, you know, like, and I'll get into this next week when I talk about Amelia Earhart. Kate Werner, uh, unbeknownst to her, obviously, and maybe really not, not really regarded by many people. There was an organization in World War II called the SOE. I don't know how many of you are familiar. That's worth a talk itself. The Special Operations Executive was formed in 1941 in London. They were also called the Baker Street, the Baker Street Boys. Um, they were on Baker Street, same, ad, same street where Sherlock Holmes lived. And it was pushed 
It was pushed by Winston Churchill. And during the Second World War, it was really a terrorist organization besides espionage. And they used to get people from occupied Europe, train them and send them back. They did want, if you were from France, they send you to France. If you were from Poland, they send you to Poland, whatever the case may be. During the Second World War, some 14, 15,000 people will go through the SOE doors and perform. Of those, 4,000 will lose their lives in the Second World War. Many of them were not only men, many of them were women. Women who perhaps used a radio, uh, sabotage, uh, even, even killing. Uh, so interesting what you see here Kate Werner doing in the American Civil War, then fast forward to something like the SOE. And fascinating too, this sort of appealed to some ladies, it didn't make any difference if these were straight ladies, lesbians, whatever the case may be. The SOE took them all in. They took in conservatives, liberals, uh, Republicans, Democrats they take in, uh, 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 labor, maybe maybe a member of the Labor Party who wanted to give us all, or communists, socialists, they didn't care. All they cared about was performance. But a number of these people were women. And so when you take a look at what we're going to look at next week, uh, that Amelia Earhart, and she wasn't the only one, but Amelia Earhart's effect on women flyers for this country in World War II, moving those planes across the Atlantic. Yes, these were Kale, uh, Kate Warner, uh, the Amelia Earhart. One of the where are some of those are some of those trailblazers in this particular endeavor we're talking about. But the Pinkerton, the the, the Pinkerton uh, organization is still around today. Uh, it, it's it's uh, so it's been around. Oh, well, it was 1850. It's been around going on now 171 years. Not a bad, not a bad run so far. Not a bad run. Anybody have any questions or 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 or, or observations? As I said, there is not really much to really speak of with regards to Kate Warner because there's not enough, there's not enough inf there's really not a lot of information on her. But you're all you can all ask questions. Uh, observations. Mark, it looks like there's, there's something here. It says Nancy Wake yeah. is part of the SOE and it talks about the SOE in the book code name Helene. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you had to have a, uh, yeah, you had a code name, all right, because if you didn't, you might wind up, you might wind up in a Nazi prison camp or worse. Um, you know, they also had a camp and they trained women up here too. Uh, they had a camp called Camp X. There's not much written about it. There's not much written, although I do have a book, book here in my collection on the SOE. And it was run by the British. You know, the, the, even before America got into the war, the British Security Coordination had an office in New York. It was on the 36th floor of the Rockefeller Center. Now, in doing some research, I went down to the Rockefeller Center. This had to be about 20 years ago because I had the exact name of the office that the British were using. And I went down there and I went, I said, I'd like to go to the 36th floor. I'm looking for, I think a 3603, that room doesn't exist. I said, well, according to, according to the information I have here, uh, 3603 was the home of the British security coordination in World War II, starting in 1940. Oh, uh, that, that, that room doesn't exist. So, and this is years after the war, but they didn't want people to know that the British security coordination run by the British Secret Service and affiliated with the SOE was up on the 36th floor of, uh, of Rockefeller Center. In fact, if you read, if you read some of the founding stories of James Bond that, that Ian Fleming made up, he assassinates somebody in World War II, James Bond does, from that building, from Rockefeller Center. 
Interesting. But they had a place called Camp X. The British Security Coordination ran this, opened it up and ran it. And it was on the Ontario, it was on the Canadian side of Lake Ontario, not far, not all that far from Niagara Falls. And so these agents would go up to this camp in the middle of the woods, and it was guarded by British commandos who were in the woods. You, God forbid you went in there. And they would train these agents for work in Europe and work in Asia. In fact, when the war started, the United States Army and the United States Marine Corps sent a few of their drill instructors to Camp X to learn their dirty tricks of hand combat, hand-to-hand -hand combat at Camp X. In fact, um, there was a man by the name of Bill Fairburn. He was captain of the Shanghai police for the British, wound up being second in command of the Shanghai police. And he was transferred. He was in his late 50s here. He was in his late 50s and sent to Camp X. Him and a man by the name of Eric Sykes designed a knife. It's called the Sykes Fairburn Commando Dagger. And it's a dumb, and I've seen, I've, I've got, I've got some uh, technical books by the, on the SOE and the OSS. And this knife was brilliant. About a five and a half, almost six inch blade, durable handle so you couldn't lose the grip, but it was double edged. The blade was double edged. And it was made so that when you stabbed and it hit bone, the blade wouldn't break. And they used to teach you how to stab at this camp. For instance, when you snuck up behind a sentry, a guard, and you take your hand and you pinch up the nose and the and the and the, and the nose with your thumb and forefinger, you clamp the rest of the mouth, rest your hand over the mouth, because when you stab, people involuntarily grunt or groan or make a noise. And according to what they taught them up there, you, you know, like in the movies, you just ram the blade in and ram it out. No, that's not how this works. When you ram that blade home, you twist and turn the blade on the way in and you twist and turn it on the way out. That's what you do. You're destroying the kidneys is what you do. These are the sort of things that they used to teach these men and women uh, for, for missions overseas. Uh, they even made, they, when they came out with plastic explosive, maybe some of you have probably seen that where it looks malle malleable like clay. Uh, they delivered some, they delivered it all over the place, but one of the places they delivered this stuff to was for use by the, uh, by the SOE or LSS in Burma. And they used to leave the, the plastic explosives on jungle trails and make it look like elephant dung. Well, you know, some of these soldiers are marching through the jungle. You, you think you think that you think they sometimes know they're, 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 they're marching in elephant dung and they put it on the, the jungle trails so it would blow off the feet or legs of Japanese soldiers. I mean, this is what they were doing here. Where do you think groups like the PLO learn some of their stuff? Mark, World War II. Interesting. Fascinating. We have another one. Let's see, did she have a code name? Who, Kate Werner? Yeah. She took various aliases. Okay. She, that's what she did. She took various aliases. Uh, it, that's a code name if you want to get down to it. It's a code name. Uh, but she had various, like Mrs. So and so, Miss So and so or she rearranged her name, or she used her last name, but changed her first name, used her first name, changed her last name. It's, it's the same sort of thing. All right. And then she we have, was pretty good with disguises, by the way. You have okay. to have that. We have, we have do, you, do we know anything about her earlier years, family, education, marriage? She must have been intelligent as, as was she as well, well educated one must think but the information i have really doesn't have anything on her 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 we'll call it previous life although i do know she was she got married and she was a widow by the time she's 23 years old so okay Isn't i mean you would have to go i didn't get a chance to do this you'd have to go to a place like Erin, new york and tap into maybe the city historical society and see if there's any additional information on this lady 
that's probably the way that's probably the way to start that you know if you want to get what she was like as a child well how were she was treated by her parents maybe her her school work that kind of thing so um there's also there was a female spy during the civil war in dc was kate active in these kinds of situations oh yeah you know trying to uh trying to uh, maybe infiltrate a spy ring or, or, or bring to book secessionists who were looking maybe to sabotage, sabotage a train or whatever the case may be. I mean, the Pinkertons themselves did that. But again, because they didn't have, they didn't have a, uh, a secret service or an, F, or an FBI or, or really military intelligence to speak of. All they had really were the Pinkertons. That's all they had. Okay. You know, you're making this up as you go along while the United States is modernizing. That's basically what you're seeing here. You know, they're going to learn, historically, they're going to learn what the Pinkertons did during the war and then create a government service like the Secret Service was created on July 5, 1865. I mean, the war is really only three months, three months over, not even three months over. And they're going to come up with that. So they knew what they had to do uh, at learning, learning that learning curve from the war. And so you'll have the Secret Service. Interesting. Fascinating. Um, this one, if the Pinkerton agency discovered this attempt on Lincoln's life, why was this procedure not continued on Lincoln, considering the number of attempts you read about in books on his life? It yeah. being such a high emo emotional civil war. Well, it, you know, there, there were other attempts, but of course, what we're talking about today concerns Kate Werner. That's where we went here. But yeah, um, there were supposedly other attempts. In fact, you know, Lincoln, you know, Lincoln, in fact, I think I gave that talk here when I, no, maybe I didn't. That's worth a talk. Um, the pseudo dictatorships of Lincoln and Jefferson Davis. Um, flirtation with dictatorship was the name of the talk. And Lincoln, you know, the border states is where the problem is. Places like Maryland, Kentucky. Uh, in fact, Lincoln, believe it or not, during the war is going to have 15,000 people rounded up and jailed. And most of these people or many of these people are not going to go through a civil court. Guess what kind of court? Military court. Many of them were let go later on. But but during the war, is it doesn't the president really once Congress turns over power, doesn't he really become a dictator, pseudo dictator? Yeah, he could. He could. That's the problem with a war. And you know, like I said, when you when you uh, when the SOE would send, you know, if they had Belgian agents, they would send them to Belgian. If they had French, they would send them to France. Dutch, they would send to Holland. Although a number of SOE types and OSS, American OSS, wound up in Yugoslavia. And they're not, they're not Serbs, they're not Croats, they're not Slovenes, and so on and so forth. Uh, and they opened up affiliations with Tito. And uh, they're the ones that bring back the information. We can work with Tito when the war is over with. But uh, the, the SOE appeared in a, a wide variety of guises and did a lot of destruction. Interesting, too, with the SOE, sometimes the British Secret Service didn't like the SOE because of the fact they make too much noise. The British Secret Service likes to operate under the cloud here so you don't know what's going on. Not the SOE. I mean, they used to they used to sabotage trains, bridges, so on and so forth. So uh, they were kind of the rambunctious type, the Baker Street Irregulars, uh, hearkening back to um, Sherlock Holmes on Baker Street, <laughs> the Baker Street Irregulars. Interesting, but a lot of them were women. A lot of, but out of fifteen thousand people in the SOE, four thousand lost their lives. That's a high rate of loss. It truly is, especially after Hitler decided that if they capture these people, execute them. No? 
So it was a no, no holes barred, uh, no quarter given type of atmosphere here. Fascinating. You got to give these women credit. You know, you know the guys, but some of these women, you got to give them credit. Some of them had more guts than many guys I know. Interesting. Fascinating. And that includes Kate Warner. She didn't have to do this, but she must, she had a, but she had, she had that chutzpah to do it. Fascinating. Some of these people, they truly are. Oh, just one passing remark here. That place I know I mentioned Camp X was supposed to have been, was going to be open. And I'm not sure if they ever did this. We're supposed to open it as a museum. And I don't think they ever did which would have been a fascinating place to go because uh, uh, even on the American side, they used to smuggle people across Roosevelt Beach <laughs> and then get them into Canada and then take them to Camp X and train them. In fact, I don't know how many people remember the Corda brothers, Alexander Corda and his brother. They were, they were movie producers and directors. They were hired by the British security coordination to build movie type sets at Camp X so they could blow them up. So even Hollywood had a little bit of a part here. Interesting. Next week we do uh, Amelia Earhart, who is a fascinating character study and who, who when she did finally get married told her husband, I am Amelia Earhart and that's my name. Now, she was very much, uh, and she supported, by the way, the Equal Rights Amendment put out by Alice Burns. She supported that. Uh, she's, a very, she's a very interesting character, met some very interesting people along the way, and one of them will be Eleanor Roosevelt. Roosevelt, Eleanor wanted, her to, wanted El, uh, Amelia to take her up and teach her to fly. She did, she did take her up, but uh, they never got a chance to do that. So... So it's interesting, fascinating character study, Amelia Earhart. But that's who we got next week. Take care now. <laughs>